We are joined on the phone today by actor, comedian, Pat Miller. He's been a stand-up comedian for a long time. He's also been in films like Arnold Schwarzenegger's Raw Deal and, of course, Maximum Overdrive. It's the 35th anniversary of that film this year. And, uh, Pat, it's uh, great speaking with you. And I, I want to ask you first, I know you've been doing stand-up for a long time. Uh, can you tell the listeners a bit about you know how that came about and you know, how you got into it? Absolutely. When I was a kid, I was always a night owl. And I would watch The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and I always loved the comedians. And I thought, you know, well, hey, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of something that looks like fun. And, you know, I, I, would, I think I'd like to pursue that and see where it goes. And uh, so basically, I, I did some uh, cabaret shows at college, you know, uh, there lo- locally on campus. And then I branched out to, uh, you know, try to get time at a club opening for, uh, another college guy who was playing guitar and, you know, during a fill in time for his breaks or something. And, uh, then right out of college, uh, I just decided I was going to go for it. Of course I had to work a day job, you know, for a while to, you know, support my comedy habit. And then I moved to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina pretty soon after that and, uh, traveled around for a bit, you know, uh, doing, uh, open mics and work in MC gigs and basically sleeping in my car for a while, you know, paid my dues. And, uh, it, uh, it was, it was something that, uh, I never looked back on and never thought, well, you know, why are you doing this? You're not making any money, uh, or whatever, you know, you're barely, you know, a bohemian, uh, existence, so to speak. So, uh, <laughs> but it, it's always something I wanted to do. Uh, and I enjoyed it. I uh, did that for probably 24 five 26 years yeah that's definitely something that you need to um if you're going to do it you got to kind of have to be in all the way as you mentioned uh, even when you have to work you know every other hour of the day it seems has to be devoted to that yeah well it's it's kind of funny uh, you get paid for you know as an mc you get paid for your 15 minute set you know as a feature you get paid for your 30 minute set and a head as a headliner you get paid for you know 45 minutes to an hour and a half set and then everybody looks at it and goes, oh, gosh, you're making great money. You don't have to work, you know, an hour, you know, 45 minutes or an hour a night. And then they don't take into consideration the travel time, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the sleeping in the, the sleeping in the, uh, you know, strange beds, you know, hotel beds. And, you know, you get there and then they don't have the room for you because the club forgot to book the room. And uh, it's, it's, it's not all glamour. Uh, as, as Steve Martin so uh, eloquently said, comedy is not pretty. Well, Pat, how did that uh, eventually transition into acting? Did somebody see one of your sets and um, it kind of went from there? How did that work? Um, well, the acting thing uh, sort of uh, went hand in hand because uh, in college I was a theater major. I just had the bug bite me about, you know, wanting to entertain and, you know, be a showman. And, um, so I was at a place in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's no longer there, uh, called the comedy Inn, And, uh, I was there and the guy, uh, who was a B movie producer, uh, saw me on stage and said, Hey, I need you in my movie. And he walked up to me and says, hi, my name's Chuck Eisen and I'm a producer. And I said, yeah, and my name is Mahatma Gandhi, and I'm the Pope. I didn't believe the guy. You know, I thought it was just some <laughs> guy being an idiot. And, uh, yeah, so good thing for me, he took, uh, he took my, uh, my response uh, in, in, in hand. Of course, the guy that I was in, I was played in that movie, was, uh, was sort of a jerk anyway, so uh, it all sort of worked out. And then after that, you know, I was traveling around. You know, I was hanging out in Charlotte traveling around doing comedy, uh, try to get an agent because, you know, it's hard to get a film without, you know, a legitimate film without an agent and, uh, couldn't get anybody interested in me. But then I got two B movies, um, right off, right out of the bat without an agent. And then all of a sudden all the agents were going, Hey, we're missing out on 10 to 15% of this guy. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I got an agent and I auditioned for a couple of, uh, couple of movies and then i i landed uh, the first movie i landed uh with an agent was uh was maximum overdrive 
Well, yeah, and I want to ask you about that, of course. Um, 35th anniversary here coming up this year. And, you know, that's uh, quite a story from going from getting approached at a show to eventually winding up in Maximum Overdrive, which, you know, obviously was a big deal at the time. You know, Stephen King directing. And can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, portraying the character of Joey? I know that film is a favorite for so many people. (laughs) You know, it's funny. And I'll get to the I'll get to the question here in just a second. But uh, I wanted to say this. Um, it was, it was not as big a deal at the time as it has become. It, it's crazy how cult status, you know, this movie has become. Um, and until about, uh, maybe two or three years ago, I had no idea that this thing wasn't just something, you know, laying in the, in the bargain basement bin of, a you know, <laughs> a used, uh, uh, CD or DVD store, you know, or Blu-ray store, um, but as far as uh, as getting the film uh, and being portray- portraying Joey, uh, it was it was sort of well he's a Southern guy which I am, and uh, the script read like he wasn't uh, wasn't the uh, brightest bulb in the pack, you know, and uh, just sort of a whipping boy for the uh, for the owner, Mister Hendershot who was portrayed by Pat Hingle, who is probably one of the nicest men in the entire motion picture industry, but just, just thought the world of that man, just a great guy. And it was, uh, it was just, it was just very, very good luck for me, actually, that I got that. And it was a very strange audition. The, uh, the, it was an open call, you know, just heard people in, you know, like cattle. And I found out later that, uh, they had already cast the role. And so I read for it and as happened, you know, you just, everybody reads the same little, you know, sides I read for it and, uh, they said, okay, thank you very much. And I walked outside, uh, to get back in the, the car to drive back the six hours to home from where we well, from where we auditioned in Wilmington. And all of a sudden there's this guy comes running out of the studio, screaming my name. And I said, right here I am, what's the matter? They want you to come back in and read again. And I said, well, all right, let me go back in there. And I read again, and I thought to myself, you know, this is the weirdest. I've never, I have never had an instantaneous callback. You know, it usually you go, you go when it's callback like in a couple of days or, you know, whatever. Sure. But th- this time I went back in and just, uh, I just you know, read it again. And I said, okay. And they said, same thing. Okay, thank you very much. And I, w- I left. So I'm driving back on I-74, or not I-74, Highway 74, uh, between uh, Wilmington and Charlotte, because I-40 wasn't open yet then. And I got to thinking, this is the strangest audition I've ever seen. Them. I've never been to an audition like this. This is just odd, so bizarre. I said, and, you know, I didn't pay much attention to anybody else in there. Because one of the people that were the uh, that were doing the audition uh, was a hot blonde, and you know I was 25 years old, and you know your your mind tends to think in other directions other than you know being having your nose to the grindstone on what you're doing. And uh, then I realized that this one guy was in there really weird. I said, "Man, that guy was strange. That guy was he was just weird. Oh my God, that guy was Stephen King." <laughs> and I had, he had, he, uh, all the things I'd seen him in, he had a full beard and he was shaved, clean shaven in this deal, you know, and, at this time. So I whipped the car off the side of the road on the highway and I'm driving an, uh, a Ford Escort. Okay. And this big 325 pound guy jumps out of this Ford Escort and I'm running around the car like an insane person. Because I had just auditioned for Stephen King, and it didn't dawn on me till about an hour and a half after the fact. <laughs> so, yeah. So, in, in, in fact, they had indeed, or I don't know for a fact, but I had, it was rumored that they had cast the role. And the guy that they had cast it in, uh, had cast in the role, was a guy in New York, a New York actor. And he ended up in the film... Uh, in the uh, drawbridge scene next to, uh, in the car seated next to Marla Maples. Oh, sure. Who, uh, I don't know if you remember Marla Maples or not. Yeah, yeah. 
Donald Trump's one of Donald Trump's wives, uh, and the, the some guy crashes into their windshield, and they both scream. And I got the, uh, you know, I got the sixteen weeks on the movie, and he got the cameo. So, uh, you know, that, I felt pretty good about life at that point. <laughs> You mentioned the film not being considered a big deal at the time, which I think is is odd. I mean, considering Stephen King was you know directing, and you had ACDC on board. You know, it seems like that right. film should have been way bigger when it came out. Yeah, I I don't know. Well, I don't know if I should dish dirt here or not, but uh, the, the production uh, Dino De Laurentiis uh, was sort of a a, a tyrant in a way. Uh, and if things didn't go Dino's way, he would just pull stuff, you know, uh, when we were shooting the end of the movie, uh, we didn't have craft services. We, we barely had enough lights to get the, the night scene shot. Uh, it was, it was interesting. It was an interesting time, but Dino was just over it. And, uh, just, he was, Steven was balking a little bit too much at, you know, I guess what he was wanting. And so Dino just started shutting the money down. We had, it was a fun it was a fun shoot it really was it sounds like um you know everyone looking hot and miserable on the scenes uh maybe that was uh, not all because of the acting it sounds like maybe behind the scenes might have helped that a little bit too <laughs> well the fact that it was uh august in north carolina the uh humidity was probably close to 96 or 97 percent uh, and it was probably 98 degrees. So yeah, the, the hot part and the miserable part wasn't hard to pull off. Uh, <laughs> even at night it was kind of stuffy. Uh, and, uh, then add to that while we were filming, uh, hurricane Gloria, uh, blew through Wilmington. So that shut us down for a little bit. Wow. Um, and the, uh, it was, it was, it was just a, it was just a crazy time. Um, uh, and you know, a, a lot of friendships I've made on that film, I still have to this day. Uh, my buddy, Barry Bell, who is going to be with me down in Leland on the 19th. Uh, and then a couple guys who have passed. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, Mr. Hendershot was played by uh, Pat Engel. And he, he was a very, very nice man during the off times we would go in, I would, I would go knock on his trailer door if he wasn't busy. And if I knew he wasn't on, you know, too much on the schedule till after lunch or something. And I would go over and visit with him and he would regale me with stories of, uh, uh, his early years and, uh, on, being on Broadway and Andy Griffith and Burl Ives. It was, it was a great history, I mean, theater history lesson, you know, uh, and, and just a, a just a nicer man you would not want to meet. I promise you. Awesome. Well, you know, of course, it's become such a cult classic over the years, and it seems maybe almost it's better that way. It's been, you know, all these years, people discovering the film and still loving it, and, you know, that opens up the doors for conventions, you know, and stuff like that, I guess, as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, and by the way, if uh, anybody out there listening to this uh, has a convention (laughs) uh, (laughs) in in the uh, greater Minnesota or... uh, midwest area that would uh that could that could use a guy from maximum overdrive uh please uh check out my uh check out my fan page on facebook it's uh pat miller joey from maximum overdrive uh and also have a uh a website which is uh j patrick miller dot com and j patrick miller is the name i had to use for screen actors guild because somebody already had pat miller so (laughs) imagine that my name being taken by somebody else before me yeah that'd be great if uh, maybe we could see uh, around uh, these parts here i know we have a lot of uh, horror conventions and stuff around the twin cities so you know maybe something will work out that'd be great yeah i've got uh, i've got a couple friends that live up in uh, minneapolis st paul area and uh, what's that about an hour or so from where you guys are uh yeah just about an hour north yeah. And, uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, I love the Midwest. I honestly do. Um, it, it's, the people are so nice and, uh, um, it's just, it's, a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing part of the country. I mean, I think maybe, uh, one of the, one of the, uh, the more, uh, real, uh, parts of the country actually. 
Well, we appreciate you saying that. Uh, yeah, I'll see. No, you. I mean, I like it. I mean, I really do. A lot sure. of the comics that I used to hang out with from the Midwest uh, were just decent, solid people, and uh, and I, I like that. I like that a lot. And I've read that uh, coming up, there's going to be actually a screening of Maximum Overdrive uh, June 19th, I think, and and that's supposed to be um, at the original place where the movie was shot. Can you tell the listeners a bit about that? Basically, we are going to go back to the uh, original set uh, in Leland, North Carolina, for where the Dixie Boy used to stand before it was blown up in the film. And uh, they're going to show the movie on the set, which I think is just a great idea. Um, the last I checked in February, it had sold out, uh, but with the stipulation that due to uh, COVID restrictions, they were limited to, I think it was 150 or 200 people. Um, uh, and with things hopefully getting more freed up, there might be still tickets available to that deal. Uh, but, uh, that, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, myself and another cast, uh, cast member who's a very very dear friend of mine uh barry bell who played uh, steve gaten another one of the uh, pump jockeys if, if you will uh are, are both and i are going to be down there uh, signing autographs and uh, i've got some t-shirts and uh, a few things like that to uh, to hawk to the uh, fans so to speak Awesome. Yeah, that'll be fun again uh, coming up on June 19th. And, you know, it's great you guys got the original uh, shooting place for Maximum Overdrive. It's great that, you know, it still exists and it's still out there. Yeah, it's uh, it's a vacant lot, but it, that's funny. You know, it's we shot that movie, what, 30, let's see, 85. So we're talking 36 years ago. We shot it coming up on the 35th anniversary. It's released in July. Uh, oh, and the June 19th date, let me, this guy is genius, this Kenny guy. Um, that that does on set on set cinema. He looked at the movie and saw in the opening scroll, you know, there on June nineteenth, blah blah blah, the Rhea M comet, you know, all that whole, you know, the the uh, epilogue thing there. Uh, so he picked June nineteenth, and it happened to be on a Saturday this year. So that's kind of cool for the you know the hardcore Maximum Overdrive fans. Definitely. Well, Pat, I know uh, besides uh, Maximum Overdrive, uh, and again, you'll be uh, at a screening of that coming up on June 19th, and all the details are on your Facebook page. And You know, you've had a chance right. to work with, uh, you know, some other, you know, Schwarzenegger, obviously, and Raw Deal, and I know David right. Lynch and, and Blue Velvet. I, I mean, are, yeah. you, are you open to more acting uh, down the road, or is comedy oh, kind of the Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If it were ever to come about, I mean, the whole the whole industry has changed the way things are auditioned now i mean um and, I, and i'm uh, uh i'm getting a little long in the tooth i am uh, currently 61 years old uh which uh, may not sound like that old to some folks but uh it's it's not the age so much as it is the miles on the odometer for me <laughs> um, and uh, i'm reminded of a lyric of a country song uh, if I'd have known I was going to live this long, I'd take better care of myself. But uh, the acting thing has just changed. The audition process is you send in a, a clip of uh, on on your iPhone or whatever, and uh, uh, I just don't I just don't understand how the business works. So, but uh, I am not opposed. And if uh, if they ever do a remake, which they've talked about it two or three times, of uh, Maximum Overdrive. The latest remake story is that Joe Hill, who is uh, Stephen King's oldest son, uh, wanted to do it over. And I would love, I would love to have some sort of a role, if not just a cameo or something, in that one as well. Uh, that that would be that would be the crazy, you know, that would be the crazy icing on the cake for me to do that. And the uh, uh, can I mention David Lynch just briefly? Can we can we talk about David Lynch? Just oh, a second? certainly. Okay, one of the nicest guys in in the the directing end of things. Uh, I got I'm in the deleted scenes. Uh, and oddly enough, I played a stand up comedian in this movie in Blue Velvet. I was Isabella Rossellini's opening act at the Slow Club. Okay, and uh, the scene was cut. But if you can go on the deleted scenes on YouTube. I think it's about the seven or seven thirty mark on the running, uh, you know, little running time on the bottom of the of the video there. Um, 
and you can see you can see some uh, really really bad stand up, but that's what he wanted. <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, "Here uh, we go. We're going to rehearse." It was uh, it was myself, a guitarist, and a drummer, and a lady who was a fantastic belly dancer. And you set the scene like this: I would tell a joke. The drummer would do a rim shot. The guitarist would start playing Blue Velvet. And then the belly dancer would uh, dance across the stage. You know, typical David Lynch, you know, yeah. <laughs> odd, odd, oddball kind of stuff, right? And uh, unfortunately, it didn't make the film because it, 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 uh, it was a lot of, uh, it was a lot of footage, uh, you know, that, were, that was cut. And uh, I don't feel so bad because... Uh, Megan Mullally was also in that movie, okay. and uh, she ended up on the cutting room floor too. You know, from uh, Karen from Will and Grace. Sure. Okay. And uh, the but the nicest thing was uh, David Lynch sent me a thank you note and a uh, a pen, a lapel pen, that you know, like uh, had a clip on the back of it, and it said Blue Velvet. You know, the Blue Velvet. You know, the pen, and he said. Uh, Thank you. Sorry you didn't make uh, you didn't make the final cut. Blue Velvet Forever, David Lynch. And I mean, I never got anything like that. So I mean, he's just a very, very class guy, you know. Sure. Wonderful guy. Um, and then when I met Schwarzenegger, uh, I'll just tell you quickly about him, if if, if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's great. Okay. All right. Because um, I do. I you. If you haven't noticed, I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I met Arnold Schwarzenegger briefly uh, because our, my, the scene I was in Raw Deal, um, I was in drag, and uh, I played a uh, bartender at this uh, at this gay bar. And the scene I had was with Robert Davi and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I didn't I didn't interact with with Arnold much, but uh, it was it was a it was a fun role, and I worked really hard to get that. Uh, I actually had to convince the casting people that, you know, I could do that role. So I went and had, I hired somebody to do my makeup, you know, as a woman, you know, and had, a, I got a wig and uh, they ended up using my actual hair in the movie. Um, and I sent them pictures, uh, back to the casting director and he sent them to the director and I got, I got it that way, awesome. uh, but I did not want to become uh, it's so easily is done in this business. I didn't want, didn't want to become typecast, you know, uh, as the, uh, as the Southern goober, <laughs> which was, uh, pretty much, uh, was Joe, Joey. Sure. I want to tell you one interesting story. If I, I don't know how much, uh, I don't know how much, uh, freedom I have, but I'll try to, I'll try to clean this up as much as possible okay. for, so I won't offend any viewers. Uh, maximum overdrive had a lot of accidents on it. Uh, the director of, of uh, the cinematographer had lost an eye because they didn't take the blades out of the lawnmower and a piece of wood flung out of the lawnmower and caught him in the eye. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was pretty, it was pretty graphic stuff. And uh, I had a, not a similar thing, but I had an accident as well. Uh, when the happy toys truck is fueling up and uh, then it pulls off and I said, Hey, you ain't full yet. I don't know if you remember that scene or not, yeah, but yeah. anyway, uh, as the things pull it out, the hose is supposed to pull out of the back of the of the big squeeze handle, and then the handle and the nozzle are supposed to drive off with the truck. Well, due to the heat or something, the glue they were using set up harder and to where they didn't the hose didn't pull out, and when the truck pulled off, the nozzle part of the handle snapped off down into the tank, and the handle. That heavy part, you know, is where you squeeze to, you know, the gasoline out or the fuel, diesel fuel out, came flying back at me. Yeah. It did not hit me. It did not hit me anywhere that uh, you would you would have wished it would have hit me. Uh, <laughs> but let me put it this way: uh, when it did hit me, I immediately dropped to the ground. Oh man! And I, I sounded like Mickey Mouse for about two days. Yikes! <laughs> You know, yeah, not not good. <laughs> Suffering for your art. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Suffering for my art. That's a good one, Dustin. <laughs> You're a funny guy. I like that. 
Well, Pat, it's been great speaking with you. I know you've got a lot of cool stuff on your website, jpatrickmiller.com. you got shirts and you know, autographs, right. a lot Much. of cool stuff for the fans. So hopefully uh, you'll yeah. get a chance to check some of that I've got, stuff out. I've got the T-shirts. Uh, they have they have my face on the back. They have the Dixie Boy logo on the front. Uh, and you're going to get us an awful lot of trouble, man. Is the is the It's a cartoon. like uh, It looks like a Lichtenstein painting kind of. Uh, it, was, it was very artfully done by a good friend of mine. I'll give him a plug, Steve Curtis. Uh, he's, he, he helps me a lot with the artistic stuff. And um, also, I have uh, ceramic mugs from the Dixie Boy. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, got, uh, it's got a little, couple little end jokes on the, on the printing there. It's uh, shower supplies, com- or sh- hot shower su- uh, supply and comet survival gear. Uh, and then, uh, at the bottom, it says everything we've got everything, which is a play on words of what I said. My character was asked what all, uh, Hendershot had down in the basement. He said, everything, he's got everything. Sure, so sure. everything, we've got everything. And, uh, <laughs> then I've got the autographs, which is an actual, uh, movie still, uh, that was taken, you know, promotional still that was taken by, um, the actual set photographer. And I got permission to use that and autograph those. Um, uh, got some other things maybe coming out in the near future. Uh, I've got a really cool, uh, poster, um, uh, poster size thing, uh, that as soon as I figure out how to ship it, <laughs> I'll put that on my <laughs> website, but right now it's, it's convention only, uh, right. because I don't know how I can't afford, I can't, I can't figure out how to affordably ship it to people without charging, you know, too much money for it. Sure. Excellent. Pat, I am a huge fan of yours and it's been great speaking with you today. Thank you so much for your time. Well, let me, let me ask you one other quick question, buddy. (laughs) Okay. Has anybody ever referenced your name to a a Kansas song? Oh, sure. Dust in the wind. I've gotten that since I was a little kid. I figured as much. (laughs) Yep. I I knew it wasn't. See, I've never had an original thought. (laughs) Uh, Well, no, that's just, uh, kind of the cards i've been dealt dust in the wind uh dusty roads um, a lot of stuff yeah over the years that's the oh, that's the, the go-to dust. the big dust yep <laughs> let me tell you something tell them, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. right my favorite my favorite wrestler of all time the big <laughs> dust dusty road well pad again thank you so much for speaking with me and um, hopefully we can see you around uh, the twin cities yeah. here we'll get you at a convention or something yeah, I hope I'd, I'd love to be up in a convention in that area or anywhere in the Midwest. Anybody happen to hear this thing? Um, you know, I've got uh, nothing booked out that way, so I will uh, be. I, I have uh, have uh, autograph and uh, uh, merch, and will travel. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Thanks a lot. Hey, it's Dad. a pleasure, buddy. Thank you so much. You're a really great guy. Appreciate your time. All right, I appreciate yours. Thank you. Thank you. And again, that was actor, comedian Pat Miller as we celebrate the 35th anniversary of Maximum Overdrive. And again, uh, he'll be at a screening of Maximum Overdrive coming up on June 19th. All the details will be on Pat Miller's Facebook page, Joey from Maximum Overdrive.